It has been 100 years since Harold Gray's comic strip Little Orphan Annie debuted on August 5, 1924. In observance of that, this week we're representing episode 296, in which Kumar and I discussed the first two volumes of IDW's collection of Little Orphan Annie strips. This flashback episode was originally published on September 26, 2011. In sitting down to edit this episode, I discovered that, for reasons I cannot fathom, Kumar's voice was recorded on a three-second delay. So that explains why I'm... you'll hear me laughing at jokes he says before he actually says them, and I keep talking over him. Uh, but uh, it's... the overall effect is not too bad. You'll get a lot of good information out of this, and uh, I edited out the uh, empty spots. So, anyway, uh, enjoy. Eh, computers. This is Tim. And this is Kumar. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo with Kumar in Melbourne. And our topic this week is Little Orphan Annie. Um, which, it's interesting. I had assumed that Everybody would know Little Orphan Annie right off the bat, but uh, I found uh, a friend of mine who admittedly is not really a comics person um, assumed that Annie started with the musical. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I guess the comic strip has kind of been out of uh, public consciousness for a while. Um, but I, well, when when the strip finally was canceled last year, I guess it was in like four newspapers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Um, and it ended in the middle. Of, it ended with uh, I think I, I didn't read it, but I heard it was like it ended with Annie abducted and tied up. Somewhere. Right. Yeah. Um. Well, I was I was Thanks. reading it online the last few months. I didn't realize it was about to end. Um. But it was. It's kind of strange because for several months there, Annie barely appeared. They had some other storyline going on that seemed to be set up. And then when Annie finally did get into it, she got kidnapped, she right. got taken to South America, and that was the end. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Um, right. Anyway, well, but let's go back to the beginning where, where we are, because what we've read is uh, the stuff from the 1920s. Um, well, we both read, right, we no, both I, read I volume read two, and this is the, the series of hardcovers that IDW is putting out. Um, I read the first two volumes, um, so it, it started in August of 1924. Um, the first volume goes through 27, and then volume two is, finishes 1927 and gets almost to the end of 1929. I wanted to t talk a little bit about the origin of Annie because, or like how Harold Gray came up with her, because I kept, I found very, I guess there are varying stories about it. Um, the, well, okay. I the, any of them. the forward of volume one, well, actually both, both volumes start with an, with a, well, there's a kind of a short forward and then there's an essay by a guy named Jeet here. Um, who I guess he, he's kind of a classic comics yeah. guy who I'm tempted to try to invite on the show. Um, but uh, he he mentions that there are conflicting stories about it. Um, let's see. Okay. By one account, Sidney Smith came up with the idea of an orphan boy and offered it to Gray. A variation of this tale has Gray coming up with a character named Little Orphan Otto. And... Uh, Patterson, somebody else with the newspaper, I think, curtly replying, the kid looks like a pansy to me. Put a skirt on him and we'll call it Little Orphan Annie. Um, and there are a couple other stories, too. But <laughs> I was surprised that the story that Wikipedia tells is not even one that he or comes, comes close to, um, which is the idea that, that it was okay. inspired by a poem from 1885 by James Whitcomb Riley called Little Orphan Annie. And I don't know what that T is with orphaned, if that ah, means okay. orphaned. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that, because Wikipedia ah, takes that as gospel okay. and he or never mentions it. So I don't know what's up with that, but. <laughs> right. 
Um, so I guess the, there's there's no agreed on explanation for how he came up with it. Um, but mm. anyway, um, <laughs> so it starts in 1924, and um, have, so looking at the first volume and the second volume, you know, well, of course, you know, whenever you almost any time you see somebody starting out a new comic strip and then you compare it to a couple years later, there are huge differences in the art and, and the character designs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the stuff that, I mean, the stuff that I've heard of Annie is even later than this it's like mm. the 38 period. Um, if people, a lot of people consider peak. Um, and it's, it's radically oh, yeah. different from the stuff mm. that's in here as well. But, yeah, I guess we'll get around to that. I was kind of hoping that's the reason. That's the reason I got volume two because I, I avoid the first couple of volumes of any <laughs> newspaper strip. Um, I try to get a little bit later, you know, to the good stuff because I can't mm. afford to buy every volume. Uh, so I I thought okay, volume two maybe will be, you know, a bit uh, it will mm. be safer than volume one anyway. But it still wasn't. Up to the mm. Yeah, I haven't read any of that standard. later stuff. Um, so I'm in, I'm kind of interested in in picking up the the other volumes if I can afford them. IDW is up to volume seven now. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh wow. So okay. they're no they're pretty much through the 30s, I think. And uh, right, they're right. Yeah. they've gotten to the introduction of Punjab. Um, that's right. that's during the 30s, yeah. It's um, I don't know, it was mid or mm -hmm. by 38 he was in there, and Asp. There was a character called Asp yeah. as well who was added in there. Was, but I mean, I I found it really interesting to compare the first two volumes in in ways that we'll get to as we go on here. Um, but so okay. it starts out with with Annie in the orphanage, which is always referred to as the home in quotation marks. Um, and mm. it's kind of depressing <laughs> at the beginning. Well, and in volume two, she ends up back in the home for a while. Um, and it's, yeah. it's a really depressing place. And Miss Asthma who runs it is, is a bitch basically, um, really mean to her. Um, and, but in the home and a lot of other places, she's, she runs into a lot of prejudice against orphans, which I find really interesting. That makes me wonder if that was a real issue at that time. I think it must have been. Um, I I don't I don't know why he I I I say it felt real like that kind of that aspect of the strip felt real, but there's it's it's weird because it it mm -hmm. depends on who she encounters because the way. The way the strip works is Annie meets character after character, and sometimes they're really pure-hearted, uh, and they're kind automatically, and they're always kind, and they're genuinely good people, or they're genuinely horrible people. Um, and the genuinely kind people have no issues with orphans, and the genuinely awful mm -hmm. people will always I, have I trouble broke, with orphans. I broke it down into three groups. So, N near saint, Near saints... Okay. Villains and shallow idiots. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, well, there's another. There is another group which is which is bad. Um, good people who do bad things, but then ah. they redeem themselves because they were mm, all like like the banker's with. son in volume two. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're generally. Um, you know they they fit mm -hmm. they fit certain molds so to speak uh and i think i think the people who are who are vi the villains will will mm -hmm. discriminate against orphans yeah or um, so the question of whether 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 that kind of discrimination was real or not i think kind of depends on whether you think those people are real or not w whether those uh, mm -hmm. quote unquote pure villains uh, are real in the world or were around in the 30s. I'm sure there was some level of discrimination. I don't know if it was mm -hmm. exactly the way it's depicted in the book. But it felt... And there are lots of instances yeah. of um, like rich people pretending to care. Um, I, I think there are some, some instances ah. in Volume 2. Um, actually, in Volume 1, um, before we see Daddy Warbucks, we see Mrs. Warbucks. 
And so yeah. uh, the war books have, you know, start, they're a rags to riches story. Um, you know, after they got married, then. Okay. Um, More than I'm sorry. Once. <laughs> More than True. Once. But I mean, bef- before they appear in the strip, they have go- they have started out from a poor couple to like uh, you know, Daddy made a lot of money in in selling arms in World War One, um, and now they're really rich, okay. and she's become. Uh, it's really changed her personality. We find, um, we find that out later that she used okay. to be really nice, and then she became you know so kind of caught up in being stuck up and whatever. And she adopts Annie uh, on a trial, on a trial basis, uh, mm-hmm. and she, but she's just doing it to kind of impress other people that she cares so much about orphans. But but she's not really nice to Annie. Oh, okay. But did you were there other characters that you found um, were like that? Other rich. Other it it happens a lot in Volume One. Maybe not so much in Volume Two. But there were other characters like that in the first okay. volume. Okay. But although Mrs. Okay. Warbucks turned, yeah, hypocrites. Hypocrites. And although Mrs. Warbucks, okay. um, well, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but um, she turns out to be one of. <laughs> oh, <isn't that laughs> everybody's read it by now. <laughs> uh, but she turns out to be one of those characters who redeems herself. Um, at at okay. one point, she's thought to be dead. Um, and then she ends up right. re- reappearing, but she's completely changed and she's back to her old self. Uh, and she's very kind to okay. Annie. Um, so oh. yeah, she redeems herself. That's interesting because the way you've described her, it sounds like she has more dimensions than a lot of the other secondary yeah. characters. True. Although I think that might have been an afterthought by Gray because when, you know the first year or so that she's in the strip. We, you know, we never see that nice side of her. Okay. Okay. Mm. Um, okay. By the way, I I noticed. Well, of course, everybody's heard leaping lizards. Um, I think that that expression got into the musical. Okay. I'm sure it did. <laughs> um, and by yeah, volume two, yeah. he's basically settled on that, and also G whiskers as uh, exclamations of Annie's. But okay. he tries out a lot of other expressions in volume one um and i didn't get them all written mm, down okay. but i found um great caesar suspenders um <laughs> suffering scissor bills <laughs> and my favorite hot uh-huh. alligator <laughs> like I, th- there were some other others that were really weird that i couldn't find when i was flipping through just now but um he tries a lot of different exclamations in the first volume. Right. Um, right. Okay. But yeah, the, that uh, here essay at the beginning of volume one mentions that uh, Gray wanted to have um, Annie always with Daddy Warbucks. And the, I guess his editor thought it was better that she be an orphan and that she, she not be wandering around. So the oh. compromise was sometimes she's with Daddy and sometimes she's not. Well, this did that. That's interesting because that's the most notable thing about this mm-hmm. second volume, which I read. Is he shows up? They hang out for a couple of strips, and then he disappears. Yeah, well, that, that's the pattern in there. volume one. <laughs> it, it's that like from the beginning. And then he vanishes for you know six months worth of continuity or whatever. Finally, he comes back. She mm-hmm. she becomes poor basically while he's gone. She lives in luxury for a few weeks while he's there. Then he disappears. Then he she becomes poor. She's wandering mm-hmm. from house from town to town. Um, then he finally reappears and finds her again. They live together for a few weeks. Then he has some business mm-hmm. to take care of and, and he's it's, off it's... again. Uh, I was surprised how much he wasn't in it because it, it's always something that I kind of... Um, I always thought that Little Orphan Annie was mm. about Annie and Daddy Warbucks, and it's not. Well, really, yeah, he's he's, he's in it around, maybe but, yeah. half the time, or or less, depending. I would say I would say much. I would say much less than that. Um, but you know, and also you know, the other thing was I always associated Annie. I always thought it was a strip where she goes on adventures with Daddy Warbucks, 
And that's not something you really see until the 30s because he goes off on his own. I don't know if the editorial mandate changed or what, but later on it seems like he takes her mm. along on these occasional adventures. So they're, they're together Well, I think Gray must more. have worn this pattern out from the first two volumes because it gets so predictable. Like, you know, every yeah. time he says, I got to go off on yeah. business, I'll be back real soon. Then, then he doesn't come back mysteriously, right. and he's reported to be dead, and and he comes back from the dead more often than right. normal it's superheroes. Not even, it's... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's not just him because you know he leaves at one stage. He leaves in volume two. He leaves, and she ends up hanging out with a family of mm-hmm. four kids and their mother, single mother, and she the mother ends up in a car accident. And Annie has to take care of the orphans. And after pages and pages, I'm like, Where yeah, she vanishes like, through, for a while. Been, it seemed like they'd forgotten no, about her. There's no, exactly. It's like there's no mention of her for just weeks and weeks. And then finally, there's some mention. Oh, she's coming back from the hospital. Finally, I was like, you know, that's that. Was, yeah, well, and, that and, was and we weird. should mention uh, that every strip is is one day. And you go the next day strip, and it's the next day for yeah. Annie. So if 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 Mrs. I forgot. Oh, yeah. Pewter. If Mrs. Pewter is in the hospital for three months of strip, she's yeah. in the hospital for three months. Right. Well, I mean that's that's not something we should mention. It's something we have to actually talk mm-hmm. about. Is a pretty yeah. significant aspect of the strip, uh, at least at this stage. Uh, because it affects a lot of things like like that, but it also affects the fact that you know one strip is one day. It also means that it's <laughs> yes. that isn't yes, anything. Yes, I thought so. Mm-hmm. More so than with other strips, where the next strip might be you know five mm-hmm. seconds after the first strip. And also the other things with, with other strips, often the first panel is a is a recap mm-hmm. of last the la- mm-hmm. the previous day's strip. And the last mm-hmm. panel is a cliffhanger. But there are no cliffhangers here because you don't get to see what happens in the next second. Yeah. You only get to see what happens the next day. And there, there are some weird effects of that. Like, because Gray, I couldn't find many places where he strayed from that or where no. he cheated on it. But there's a scene when she's in the home and mm-hmm. there's a, a fire breaks out. But you don't get to see the, the start <laughs> or the end of the fire. It's just one strip is there and everything's fine, and the next strip mm-hmm. suddenly the place is on fire, and it's three panels of this fire, and then the next strip it's the next day. So of course it's not the fire anymore. It's all it's all over. Everything's taken care of. Very, very things just happen mm-hmm. seem to happen very spontaneously. Well, and another effect uh, I noticed is that that, that uh, often like somebody is arranging to do something, and since we can't fit it into day's strip, it has to be okay. Well, we'll do that tomorrow. And it doesn't seem like something you yeah, really yeah, yeah. need to wait till tomorrow <laughs> to do, but <laughs> but just because of the strip exactly. structure, he has to yeah, do it yeah, that yeah. way. Right, right. Well, one of the first notes I wrote down as I was reading was moves fast <laughs> slash slow. And I was looking at my notes going, why did I write that? What does that mean? Um, I couldn't figure out what I'd written. And then I realized, you know, it's because each strip is actually mm-hmm. only a few seconds of a day, you know, really just somebody commenting about something and you know it's 15 or 20 seconds out of somebody's life and then you get to the next day so it takes a long time for a one strip is just a few seconds it moves very fast but from strip to strip it's quite slow because mm-hmm. it's the next day and then the next day yeah well, and and later on in the book when she uh, is in that small town uh blunderville i think it's yeah blunderville um yeah. and she a lot of that that chapter is just her meeting people in the town. And there's that one guy who's been kind of a soldier of fortune. Turns out he kn- he knows or knew Daddy Warbucks. And we don't even actually see her meeting him. Yeah. It's like just all of a sudden they're sitting down talking. <laughs> yeah. Because he couldn't afford to fit in <laughs> yeah. the actual introduction yeah. because he wanted it has to be that one day. And... That's right. That's right. And even if he did have the introduction, then they would it would have to be like, <laughs> yeah, well, let's exactly. have coffee together tomorrow. Uh, in order to accommodate the, the strange mm-hmm. structure of the script, I'm pretty sure he kind of he must have dropped that in later years when they're having adventures, and it was important mm-hmm. to show what was happening. The next Do you remember minute. the 30 strips you've uh, read? Did that happen? Sort of, I'm trying to remember, but I think it. 
I just feel like it must have. I seem to recall people chasing each other or something, but he might have, he might have done it day to day. Um, and there's a weird thing too, because sometimes the Sunday strips are fitted into the continuity somewhere. And sometimes they just recap what's happened over the week. And sometimes it's new material. Um, so they don't even really fit into that. Yeah. Well, it day. seems like in the twenties, Gray was, wasn't sure what to do with Sundays. Um, in the first, yeah, and <laughs> well, I yeah, well, that's another problem. But um, we can talk about that in a minute. I wanted to talk about how it, what happens in volume one, because in in volume one there are just a few instances where uh, the Sunday is in the continuity of the daily, and they they printed those in right. the front of the book and then put little notes in the okay. in the margins as oh the sunday strip you have to go back to page whatever and look at it and i kept i kept missing them uh. <laughs> they're not quite obtrusive okay. enough and i would i would go on to the next strip oh wait 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 the sunday strip is relevant so i have to go back um the, the, yeah then in in the forward of volume 2 they say well we thought that that he didn't consistently do that until the 30s but we found that in 1928 all the Sunday strips are in the continuity. So the second volume has all the Sundays from 28, but none of the Sundays from 29. Because apparently he went back to gag a day. Yeah, they, they suddenly appear. And then apparently he went disappear. back to gag a day in 29. Yeah. They suddenly pop in. Um, although some of these yeah. in 28 yeah. are kind yeah. of gag a days within the continuity. I mean, they, you could read the dailies yes. without missing the Sundays. I mean, you you'd, you could skip the Sundays and it wouldn't yeah. matter. For a while there, he has kind yeah. of a separate story yeah. going on in the Sundays about Annie growing a garden. And the, and the chickens coming in and eating the right. seeds yeah, and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, yes. it, it happens to take place in the same location, but it has nothing to do with the dailies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's too bad because I I really love the the way they colored Sunday comics in that yeah. era, um, and I quite I quite enjoyed the art in the Sundays in this in this book a lot, and I w- wish they would have included mm. them even if they weren't that relevant. But yeah, I but, guess uh, the the ones anyway. that they consider completely irrelevant to the dailies they're planning to publish separately at some point. Mm. But yeah, I guess when yeah. you get into the '30s, yeah. then they're completely intertwined. Sundays and dailies. But I noticed at the end of volume yeah. one, they yeah. had advertised volume two as running through 1930, but apparently they hadn't noticed yet all the relevance of the Sundays in 1928. So then yeah. it became only yes. through 29. <laughs> so, yeah, that's interesting. Mm. Um, now, I guess I didn't notice it quite as much in volume two, uh, but um, Annie herself is kind of violent. Uh, she gets in fights and punches people. Um, it happens more in Volume 1. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I was kind of reading Volume 2. I was like, when is she going to get into the fist fights? Because that's kind of what I... Ex- that's mm. another thing I expect from Annie. Um, but she doesn't kick anybody. I even noted down, like, the first time she kicks somebody's on mm. page 50. So it took a mm-hmm. long time for her to get going. Uh in this volume um but that uh that points to an important an important thing which is annie is not um she's not very childlike uh she's i she's she's no, I don't know even if I describe her. She's really, mm-hmm. she's incredibly resourceful. I mean, taking care of four kids um, by herself. She has this can-do attitude. <laughs> yeah, she raises four kids by herself. She's completely mm-hmm. selfless and industrious. Um, she builds up in the over the course of volume two. She builds up two successful <laughs> businesses in a row. Um, she becomes a restaurant manager. Uh, she buys a house. Um, and I, you know, I, she, at one stage she, she contemplates death. Um, and I kind of, I, I was just kind of hoping for a moment in which she could act like a kid. And sometimes she does in the Sundays, but you know, it takes her, it's not until hundred page, page 120 that she buys a chocolate bar. Um, 
And finally, you know, on page 266, she watches a movie. Um, and it's almost a relief when she finally, you know, it, it's not until like page 300 that she complains about school. Every other time she's like, gee, I love going to school. Nobody else gets, you know, not every kid gets to go to school. I love it. And gee, as long as I study hard, I'll bet I can pass. I might not get A's, but, you know, I'll get somewhere in this world. It just goes on and on and on. I'm like, you know, could you, you know, and then finally, like, page 300, like, she's finally like, boy, I wish the bell would ring. And I was like, wow, finally. You know, there's a, a brief moment of, it was like, a, finally some respite uh, where oh, she finally acts like a Yeah, well, a lot of times it seems like she's um, she's internalized all the lessons of her that her non-existent parents might have taught her kind of out of her own right. mind. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, when she finally has those fist fights, for me, that's a little, that's, that's kind of a relief for me, too. Mm. It was in this volume, anyway. Just see her finally let loose mm. and, you know, kick some kids or something. Um, it was a little bit, you know, it was a little bit of childish behavior. But, I mean, it also um, kind of goes to the fighting, um, that Gray, well, maybe it's his conservatism coming out, that, um, he tend he tends to condone violence against people who do wrong, even... In vo- in volume one, there's yeah. there's um, police brutality presented in a positive light, <laughs> right? Because the guy had it coming, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, was yeah. Gray a boxer? Mm-hmm. Did I read that somewhere? Um. Yeah. Well, that's the, well. I mean, I, the, his conservatism is another is a whole mm-hmm. other thing we have to get through as well. Because part of the thing about the the strip is when I, again I I came into it and I thought okay we're going to get an adventure strip, and it's not really it's yeah. it's a political strip, essentially especially in volume two because most of the time what happens is Annie has a brief adventure which puts mm-hmm. her into a situation, it puts her onto a farm so we can have a whole bunch of yeah and, about and the plight of the farmer and, and how farmers yeah. can get ahead and it's yeah the plight of the farmer and all that. Or, um, or you know, it puts her in a situation where she has to take care of these kids, or she's in school, or what. Or it puts her in a situation where, basically, the strips are about um, just the experience of mm-hmm. living under certain conditions, or the feeling of certain emotions, um, or the politics of, of, you know, how how people mm-hmm. should behave in those situations. She's basically a mouthpiece saying. This is how people should act in these situations. Yeah, so, well, and it's, it's sorry, it, it's um, interesting somebody, because in the twenties, um, in the strip, Gray makes some pro labor union statements, um, like um, in the restaurant yeah. thing before she takes over, she's working there and being treated unfairly and goes on strike. Um, but then I guess once okay. Roosevelt yeah, yeah, yeah. comes in as president and the New Deal and everything, Gray. I'm told I read becomes more conservative and is making anti-labor union <laughs> statements in the strip. I think he, I think he publicly yeah. denounced unions at some stage and, uh, he alienated, mm-hmm. you know, his readers to a certain extent. Um, but the thing that's interesting is, as I was reading it, I mean, it is borderline. Oh crazy, yeah. Not Often the fourth panel times. should be entitled. And the moral of the story is, <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> yeah um but um it mm-hmm. is it is it is what it is i mean that's what it is this is this is a political strip and i think you have to you know any reader mm-hmm. you have to come in there knowing that uh to a certain extent. you have to just come in and say okay this is what it is and you know, I, you take it for what it is um uh even if it is times, but I think the later stuff, the thirty stuff, is mm. not quite. But I find it interesting that. that he was uh, anti Roosevelt since um, FDR appears in the Annie musical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, another kind of aspect of the same thing is, um, uh, well, I mentioned to you that the, um, the end. I found the end of Volume One kind of hair raising. Um, because uh, so mm-hmm. Annie's been kidnapped, and Daddy reappears from one of his long absences, and 
you know, gets a gang together and kind of takes the law into his own hands and catches the bad guys Mm -hmm. um, and they're arrested. And then Mm -hmm. um, he's afraid that that some shyster lawyer is going to get them off. So he calls up the senator who Mm -hmm. owes him a favor. The senator makes sure that those guys get prosecuted and convicted. But what I I read, I guess this was on Wikipedia, in later on he gets even more ruthless um because he's like um he catches a different group of anti kidnappers and says well i wouldn't bo- i wouldn't dream of bothering the police with you guys and the asp just kind of ushers them off <laughs> and they're never to be heard from wow. again um <laughs> wow, so but incredible. but i thought it's probably uh important to realize that when these strips are coming out, you know, the wild west is in living memory of, you know, the mm, older generation, sure, maybe sure. not gray himself, uh, but yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting too. Cause I, you know, the way you read this strip, I, well, I don't know. I shouldn't say you, but I tended to believe what was fed to me. Um, you know, like there's this, there's during the mm. whole restaurant sequence, um, Annie, sees some guy who's conveniently named Ruff. Yes. Everyone has a convenient name in the book. And she immediately suspects him. She finds him <laughs> suspicious for no good reason. Profiling. With his appearance. Yeah. She says, that guy looks suspicious. She's like, that guy looks suspicious, uh-huh. but I shouldn't, you know. I yeah, just profiling. I shouldn't judge. And she says this for about three or four strips in a row. Finally, we're in mm-hmm. one strip where she's following him around, and we haven't really gotten to the explanation of why. Right. She, she keeps course. saying she shouldn't but be she, suspicious, she and the next it. thing we know, she's following him. Yeah following him but the thing is the way the strip is set up i was suspicious of him too because as soon as annie says that guy's suspicious you're like yeah that guy's just sus- he must be suspicious because yeah. annie thinks he's suspicious and you know at the very end of the book um you know this guy gets arrested and the banker gets arrested and she's convinced that he hasn't mm-hmm. done anything wrong and she goes to the sheriff and she says sheriff i'm sure this guy hasn't done anything wrong the sheriff's like Maybe you're right, Annie, but there's nothing I can do. I'm like, how did this little nine-year-old girl convince the sheriff in one panel, you know, that um, she's, you know, the guy must be innocent, and he totally buys it. But I bought everything she said, too. I was not, I didn't really question, um, I'm sure if I read some of that stuff in volume one where, you know, they, where Daddy Warbucks was taking the law into his own hands, I might have reacted differently. But in this volume, I was kind of like, even you know he sets up people in such a way like we we were talking about earlier that it's they are they are there's no middle ground for the most part you know they're they're black or they're white or and they can swap from one side to the other but they they won't they won't be in the middle there'll be a bad guy that turns good maybe you know and then they'll be really purely good you can be you can you can guarantee you can be guaranteed that guy will never come into crime (laughs) again as long as he lives um so you know when Annie's suspicious of someone, that's not a gray area. That's a that's a mm-hmm. black area. That guy's no good. Uh, so I can kind of you know I can kind of see. Um, I get I mm-hmm. it kind of it functions. Yeah, well, even when when she's way. convinced that Ruff is is uh, has done something wrong, we haven't really seen anything more than circumstantial evidence at that point. No, no, not mm-hmm. not even evidence. It's just her hunches. Coming up is Wealth Bad and Annie's unusually progressive racial views for a 1920s comic strip, and much more. Do you like comics? The 1960s? How about middle-aged gay couples gossiping about their neighbors? Then you'll love Checkered Past. A loving examination of DC's GoGo Check branded comic magazines published from February 1966 to August 1967. I'm Dr. Bob. And I'm Dr. Husband. And each week we'll be your hosts on a trippy tour through mid century four color madness. Checkered Past. Available wherever fine podcasts are downloaded for free. I found. I don't think this showed up as much in the second volume, but um, in the first volume. There's this kind of schizophrenia about uh, whether being rich is a good thing or a bad thing, because uh, there are a lot of messages mm. that like being rich makes you unhappy. Um, but then when she's living with Daddy and he's showering her with all, all this stuff, of course she thinks it's great. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. but then she gets bored too. Uh, mm -hmm. At least in volume two, there seems to be some commentary about it, like oh, we're, you know, mm -hmm. we're living so lush or whatever. And then she she gets bored and she goes for a walk and then she gets lost and nobody looks. Well, for of her. course, Daddy got called. Daddy was gone and the secretary got called away on an emergency and they all checked out and they couldn't go look for her. <laughs> and at the end of volume two, they still haven't found yeah. her. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um. Well, I guess we should talk about the. It's a bit. It can get repetitious. Yeah. Well, in fact, um, <laughs> there's a whole thing in volume two that's just like repeat from volume one, um, where where yeah, when right. she's in the in the home, <laughs> and uh, she tries to she yeah. writes some letters to some people, and she she okay. uh, asks Miss Asthma oh. to mail the letters for her. Miss Asthma opens them, reads them, and throws them away, and then Annie finds them in the trash. The exact same sequence happens in the first volume. Okay. And Annie didn't learn a thing wow, from it, and the whole thing happened again. No, Annie, you <laughs> idiot, don't give her letters to mail. She's not right. going to mail them. Don't. Didn't you learn that the first time? <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he, there was some, there was some kind of rut that he needed to get out. Just the same thing. You know, especially after she built up the restaurant business, she starts mm. up this newspaper selling business, and we go through that for a while. Then she goes to another town, and she starts up this restaurant, and she becomes super successful. I'm like, you know, please don't start a third business. You know, are we going to have to go through this whole thing again? But then Daddy finds she becomes rich, then she loses all her money, and it kind of, um, at this stage, it, it's, that mm -hmm. was kind of uh, Well, and then annoying. she starts making money again as a um, golf caddy. Yeah, yeah, right. But she doesn't become the head cat in the anyway. town or anything like that. You know, it's not quite mm. as extreme as the first two uh, businesses. Because um, when she was rest managing the restaurant, it, just got, <laughs> it was too much for me. But, uh, but did you notice <laughs> um, a lot of times she ends up doing jobs that were typically associated with boys, like newspaper or golf caddy? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what st if he was trying to make a feminist statement there, but I did find that uh, Gray uh, thought that children should work. Um, he he didn't like the idea of child labor laws saying that because he thought really? he thought that preventing children from working was a cause of juvenile delinquency because kids didn't have anything to do, so they get into trouble. <laughs> I don't know. Why well, not put them in school? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, but I did find that that, that was that was a belief of his. Um, so he kept put having Annie, you know, wow. wanting to work. You know, if if like in in Blunderville, she's living with that elderly woman, and she feels like I gotta earn my keep, I gotta get a job, um, <laughs> that, yeah, just yeah. as she does everywhere Brilliant. else. Yeah. You know? And I will say it's a it's a relief it's a relief that there is no casual racism mm. in this book, which is. Typical of almost every great strip you pick mm -hmm. up from this era, there's always a housemaid or something, someone annoying, mm -hmm. some annoying. Yeah, like Terry and the Pirates. Character. And there were none. Yeah, Terry and the Pirates, or you know, Gasoline mm -hmm. Alley, or you, you name it. You know, the Spirit, whatever. They, yeah. They all. Well, I mean, the, there there are a and, few uh, quote unquote China men in there, but they're not too bad. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting is is yeah, but she sometimes she encounters those characters and she's like, "Gee, that guy spoke mm. great English," you know, or something like that. She's it's he doesn't have some kind of yeah. choppy, horrible, you know, way of speaking that's that's an object of comedy. She's like, "Wow, I wish I could speak Chinese mm. as well." Or yeah, that one guy, she's like, um, you know, he has an accent and he's talking about how. She, in order to work at that store, she would need to be able to speak German and French or whatever for the local customers. And she's like, wow, we, we, yeah. we didn't think about, right. you know, we, we might make fun of them for not speaking English well, but it doesn't occur to us that they might speak three other languages. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I thought mm -hmm. that stuff was quite even handed. Uh, and, um, you know, this is also the strip mm -hmm. that introdu introduced Punjab, who has a, a stupid name, but, um, you know, was an Indian character in a uh, comic strip and, you know, one of the 
one of the first, mm-hmm. um, if not the first. Uh, so that was kind of incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Well, and I read actually. that. I guess it was in the forties when uh, during the war when when uh, I forgot what it was called now, but but uh, he had some kind of uh, like junior ranger thing going on or something that a- Annie was sort of the leader of. <laughs> Um, in sort of a war effort okay. thing, and he included a black child in it. And actually, he took some criticism okay. for that, amazingly. Um, but right. he just felt like, you know, I have black readers, and I should, you know, have a character in here as a, you know, just kind of re- that they can identify with. And he got a lot of positive mail from black readers about that. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that is pretty remarkable for a strip of its time. Yeah, and uh, you know, in in relation to the thing about the language too, is that we have to mention the dialogue mm. is excellently written. Um, I love the vernacular mm. he uses uh, for all the characters. I think it's re- I think the dialogue is really expertly done. Um, there's a lot of it uh, in the early strips. Uh, I think because he had to compensate for the art. Um, mm which is pretty spare, uh, put it politely. Although his punctuation drives me crazy. Because uh, it's just, like, dashes between yeah, well, sentences yeah. or phrases. And it, it starts kind of <laughs> affecting my brain after yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. But but people sound like people. Like, it's, uh, I think mm. Annie has such a clear voice. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was excellently, excellently done. And there's a lot of silent mm-hmm. panels too, which is unusual as well. Mm-hmm. Quite a few, you know. Movies, and movies every five. once in a while, there will be a panel that I find really amazing for a daily strip. I think part of it is that in those mm-hmm. days, daily strips were printed considerably larger <laughs> than they have been the past few decades. Yeah. Um, but you know, th- there will be yeah, a, yeah. a panel that just shows so much in so much detail that I'm like, you know. It's just it amazes me how much he might fit into one panel. Um, there, there was right. one panel that I right. noted in in the first volume, uh, page one fifty nine. Um, so, Mrs. Warbuck has invited the, these uh, mm, these rich European characters to stay in their home and. Of course, it turns out that they're actually there to steal something from Daddy. Um, and there's a panel okay. where it's nighttime, and um, in the foreground we see the silhouette of Daddy secretly watching from a balcony as across the room below, off kind of in the background, we see the two characters breaking into his safe. Um, and there are, you know, a couple of windows with light shining in, and there's a table with stuff on it and a chair. You know, it's like a desk, I guess. And one of the uh, one of the bad guys is standing on a chair to and moving a picture out of the way to get it uh, at the safe. And there's a doorway back there. It's just, and there's, you know, you can see the boards on the in the floor. <laughs> there, there's so so much to it. And you know you you'd never see that in one panel yeah. or or a a whole strip of of a daily strip now. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Roy Crane was the real master of that. I mean, mm. his dailies were beautiful, mm-hmm. absolutely beautiful. Um, he does turn up. He does, you know, dial up mm-hmm. the art sometimes. Um, I, there's there's almost no backgrounds. And you have to mention too, famously, you know, Annie has no pupils. No, I don't think anybody has any pupils. Um, <laughs> and I never got used to that. Even at the end, I was at three. I was at page three hundred, and there was some panel where Annie was almost looking at the camera, and it just <laughs> it spooked me out. Like she just looked so ghoulish uh, with her pale face and her pupilless eyes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but the art, I mean, the art is another thing that obviously improved a lot over the years. In later years, I think you'll get more more detail in the panels, mm-hmm. like the one you're describing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but very occasionally in volume two, you'll get a really detailed panel with an unusual angle. But something mm-hmm. special has to be happening. If you can get away with describing it mm-hmm. with dialogue, he'll do it, you know. 
often no the room there's no there's almost nothing in a room except one oven or something you know whatever mm-hmm. needs yeah a lot of the panels are are pretty sparse but yeah occasionally they get a lot more detailed um i found a a, a quote from that supposedly al cap uh, said that Gray's drawings had all the vitality of Easter Island statues. <laughs> and it is it is fairly stiff in a lot of cases. Yeah, yeah, especially this And I don't know, it's it I I I was kind of freaked out by the drawing on the back cover. I don't know what's up with with Sandy in that picture. Um his tail is huge and and the trunk of his body seems yeah. a little too long also. Um <laughs> Just his proportions are off. I didn't see anything like that really yeah, in the strip yeah. itself, but this pack, this picture on the back is kind of creeping me out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is a strip that you don't read for the art. Yeah. At least in this case. I mean, it's, some, it's a strip you read for Annie's personality. Um, because there's no... there's She's never cynical. Except when a person is really, really bad and they really, really deserve it. There's no cynicism. Um, and I think that's the that's the real appeal and the attraction of this strip. And I think the other appeal is, you know, that he, that Gray wears his politics. He puts it right there on the strip. It's right there for you to see. And I think that's, it's quite appealing too, um, that he's so yeah. naked about it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I'm, I guess I guess a lot of the mail that he was getting at that time was about you know how how Annie was so upbeat all the time, and pe- I guess people really appreciated that. And of course, just as the second volume is ending, the depression has started, um, and there's a bit of a reference to it yeah, there with yeah. the stock market going down. Um, you know, the 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 older the right. father banker is has lost everything in the stock market. Um, so, yeah, yeah. although I guess, um, Gray was criticized because he kept, uh, preaching about the, the value of hard work and, and, you know, what, what, what was that quote that I found? Um, Gray was reviled by many though, for preaching in the strip to the poor about hard work, initiative, and motivation while living well on his income. <laughs> But I think it's kind of the same thing as, you know, some some uh, rock bands will start out, you know, singing about struggling and, and so, you know, start under poverty and whatever, yeah. and then they get filthy rich and it's not quite the same anymore. <laughs> well, he certainly was not working hard on drawing the strip. He basically just drew any, you know, the same uh, four panels every day. And occasionally even repeated his punchlines, so you know. Well, I was I was um, amazed that he fell back on slipping on a banana peel more than once. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh well, yeah, yeah. When she's voices, back in the home, yeah, I think it might be one of the Sundays. Miss Asma oh, slips right. on a yeah, banana yeah, you're peel. Right. You're right. <laughs> wow, you're totally right. And right. That must have been an old gag in the twenties, because that that's like a vaudeville thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. yeah, whatever. Let's just fill the strip for today. Okay, banana peel. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but he's uh, it's definitely what's the word I'm looking for? He, he's 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 got kind of a one track mind about his approach, and somehow it works. It works for Annie, and he's I think an incredible character, even though she's completely unrealistic and unchildlike. Um, her pluckiness is, 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 is it's just mm. um, irresistible. Yeah, I'd say so. I felt. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm even though the politics might rub me the wrong way, I'm sort of interested in in reading the the following volumes if I can afford them. Well, um, mm. the the cover prices are yeah. are <laughs> high. Um, the, volume one is thirty nine ninety nine. Yeah. I see the the. Two most recent volumes are forty nine ninety nine, but uh, online retailers you can wow. get like ten or twenty bucks knocked off of that. So it was, yeah, right. Big, you know, the, big, these big are books. these are like twice the size of one of the Fantagraphics Peanuts books, 
and take a lot longer to read. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as we discovered in the 12 months <laughs> to prepare this episode. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I got the first volume and, like, good grief, how am I ever going to get this read? Um, it's been sitting here on my desk for, like, a year. You're, yeah, but you're not exaggerating. <laughs> um. But yeah, I wanted to say a little bit about, uh, well, Gray continued the strip until he died in 1968, and uh, a lot of other people worked on the strip, mostly for short periods of time. Um, the only one who really had any yeah. success was Leonard Starr. Um, and I, I remember reading okay. that his strip in the 80s. I guess it started in 1980, and, went, mm -hmm. and he retired in 2000. Um, and it's okay. hard to remember now. It's been so long since I read those strips. I'm pretty sure that he didn't do the one day is one strip is one day thing. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I didn't have gray strips to compare his work to, but I remember enjoying them at the time when I was in high school. Um, mm. but yes. Yeah, so. Apparently, Gray tried to um, kill off Daddy Warbucks as or, he was dying. Yeah, I saw that he, that was his plan. Uh, as, as Gray himself was dying. Yeah, but the syndicate was like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know why he didn't just defy the syndicate. He was dying anyway. Well, and I guess that he his wishes were that the strip would die with him like, like peanuts. But uh, I guess yes. he didn't uh, get yeah. that carved in stone legally and... Uh, the syndicate carried it on anyway. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Um, but then when did the you know when did the musical start um, up? Seventy seven. His death, right? In the seventy or something like. That. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, that's you know probably the most successful adaptation mm, of a comic strip possibly. ever, if you think about it. And, going, uh, and of course, know, that's what got interest ever. back in the strip, so the the. Because I guess at the, at the time the musical came out, they were running like old 1930s strips in the paper. Um, but then oh, right. interest was brought up by the musical, so they put Leonard Starr on it. And th that was when they changed the strip to being just Annie mm -hmm. instead of Little Orphan Annie. Right. Hmm. Right, right, okay. I never even thought but, of that. Yeah, I, I remember um, living in Iowa. The Des Moines Register started carrying it when, when Starr began. So, and I th think probably a lot of other papers picked it up at that point. But yeah, so it's it's definitely worth picking up if you can afford it, or maybe petition your library to start buying them. Because <laughs> you know these are these are library worthy editions in in hardcover. So definitely. I um, mean, yeah, yeah. So that might that might be the best approach. <laughs> but yeah, read them if you can. Are we going to try to wait it? <sighs> um, I hadn't even thought about that for this. Um, story and nine art seven sometimes appro approaching nine when he really tries. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I would give it seven on at this at this stage, nineteen twenty seven to nineteen twenty nine, say seven. It's I don't think it's a fully. Mm. It's got all its wheels spinning mm. yet, but I think it's getting. Um, I don't I don't think there was any art approaching <laughs> nine at this stage. Okay. You know, it's, it's good. It's it's worth reading just for the the character. And The Complete Little Orphan Annie was published by IDW. I'm not sure that they're still in print, but many volumes are, of course, available online, though not necessarily at affordable prices. I regret that I had no way to fix the synchronization problem in this flashback episode. I tried an AI program to separate the voices, but it didn't work all that well. What's most frustrating is that I later figured out how I could have fixed the problem using the recording software I used in 2011, but by the time I realized it, I had deleted the recording from within that software, and thus it was too late to do anything about it. In 2024, I'm still saying, eh, computers. 
Thanks to our patrons for supporting Deconstructing Comics and our other podcasts. To join them, go to patreon.com slash deconcomics. Patrons get access to podcasts about the early years of The Amazing Spider-Man, Jim Starlin's run on Captain Marvel, and more. Be sure to check out our Facebook group. You can find the link to Discussion Group Facebook at deconstructingcomics.com, as well as our Facebook page and our X and YouTube accounts. From our site, you can also follow the link to shop at Amazon to support the show, find links to subscribe to the podcast, leave a comment on any episode on our site, or leave us a voicemail. Or you can write to us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com. Are you making a comic? Send it to us and we'll do a Critiquing Comics episode about it. This month also marks 25 years since the first issue of Promethea by Alan Moore and J.H. Williams hit the stands. Kumar and Emmett discussed that series in episode 591 in 2018, and we'll re-present that episode here next week. Until then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs>